tell you a story. About five years ago, a good friend of mine, Jason Jackson, and I decided to go on a road trip to Oklahoma City for a conference that he had registered us for. Now, he made all the arrangements, right? He set the hotels. He, you know, figured out what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And he also uh, rented the car. Now, I love Jason. He's a great friend of mine. But he totally cheaped out on the car. Because when I went to go pick up said rental, I remember looking at the paperwork and seeing economy under the type of car that he had rented. Now, if you've never rented a car before, you need to understand economy is the cheapest car you can get at a rental company. And usually, it's a small car. And so I remember when I'm at the desk, I, I asked the lady, listen, I know it's an economy, but can we get like the biggest economy one you got? And unfortunately, she couldn't really help us out. It was late at night. They didn't really have any other options. All they had for us was what they had reserved for us. And what they had reserved for us was not much. I mean, literally, because when I went out to the parking lot to get the car, I realized that it's a Chevy Spark and I had to look it up. A Chevy Spark is literally the smallest car that Chevy ever made. It is tiny. It is so small that it doesn't even have a full dashboard. It just had like almost like an iPod, iPad uh, on top of the steering wheel that kind of gave you all the stuff that a normal dashboard would give you. I could have sat in the back seat of this car and still driven it perfectly fine. It was that small. And so I, you know, I made fun of Jason and I busted his chops a little bit about it. But despite the tiny car, it was a great road trip, man. We were having a lot of fun. I don't know why we decided to leave at 11 o'clock at night and try to get there, you know, because it was an 11 hour road trip. Uh, but we did because we're dumb and young. And so, you know, we're having a good time though. We're listening to music. We're keeping each other awake. Thank God. And then about halfway through, maybe around three, four in the morning, Jason looks at me with this freaked out look and suddenly the fun stopped because he looks at me and he goes, bro, we're almost out of gas. Now, mind you, at this point, we're in the South. It's like three, four in the morning. He's black. I'm brown. We're a little nervous about this. Scratch that. We're terrified about this. And we're, we don't know when the next gas station is going to be. We're not sure what's going on. We're freaking out. And I was thinking about that, about, you know, how when your tank is full, if you're having a great time and when your tank is on E or, or, or almost out, you can really quickly start to panic. Last week, if you were watching our service, I mentioned uh, this question that I often ask my wife and she asked me about our love tank. It's a way for us to measure how the other is doing. So we'll ask each other, hey, how's your love tank? Do, do we need to spend quality time together? Do we need to go on a date? Are you feeling filled in love when it comes to me and you? And I also mentioned last week, one of the questions I asked you was, how's your peace tank? Are you full of peace or are you at loss of peace? I, I kind of want to keep that theme going this week, uh, but I want to talk about your spiritual tank. I, I want to find out, or I want you to find out, how's your spiritual tank looking? Is it on full or are you running on fumes right now? You know, I mentioned earlier, just having fun when your tank is on full, it's a great experience. And spiritually speaking, when your spiritual tank is full, there is this closeness to God. There is this confidence that comes from it. Um, there is this walk that you almost have. You want to worship everywhere. You can't wait to read your Bible. There's just this passion for the Lord, for his people uh, that, that comes from a full spiritual tank. But when your spiritual tank is low, there's no desire to read your Bible. There's no desire to worship. You're lucky you're even watching this right now. You know, when your spiritual tank is low, you're wondering where God is. You feel like there's a distance. You you feel like maybe God is mad at you. Uh, you know, you start to do things you didn't normally do. Things begin to shift. And a lot of that has to do with where you're at spiritually. On Are you on full or are you running on empty? And... This is a common thing that happens. As a matter of fact, there's a man in the Bible that I want to highlight today that will help you understand this by the name of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19, you see uh, two very extreme cases of Elijah. One where his spiritual tank was totally full and the other one where he was almost completely running on fumes and almost completely ran out. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, they're, they're kind of longer chapters, so... I'm going to give you just a quick synopsis of what's going on in context 
uh, of this time period. Uh, in this moment, the king of Israel and his wife Jezebel had turned their hearts and the people's hearts away from God and were beginning to worship or had been worshiping this false god named Baal. As a matter of fact, they had 450 false prophets that worshipped and were like priests to the false god Baal. And this really hurt and even angered God's heart. And so he sent Elijah full of the spirit, right? Spiritual tank on full to go and deal with this. So here's what Elijah does. Elijah tells the king to gather all the people of Israel, including the 450 false prophets, and meet him at Mount Carmel. And when he gets to Mount Carmel, he lays out a challenge, okay? He says, here's what we're going to do. Get two calves, right? Two cows. You cut up one. I'll we'll cut up one. We'll have them both cut up in pieces. And I want the 450 of uh, Baal's false prophets to pray to Baal to light that altar on fire, right? So they're going to take the calf pieces. They're going to put it on their altar to their God. And they're going to ask their God to set it on fire because that's kind of how they worship their gods in general at that time, including the God of Israel. And he goes, who's ever God lights the fire, either Baal or the real God, that's how we know who the true God is. Crazy situation, right? I mean, that's that's confident, right? To step up and say, I'm going to challenge all of you in front of everybody to prove that my God is the real God. And it ends up going that way, right? So they come down the 450 prophets are, are doing all their rituals and doing all the little things that they can do and nothing, right? Not a spark, nothing's happening. And then Elijah's turn comes up. And this is when you know he's full of the spirit and almost maybe full of himself because this is a bold thing to do. Not only is he getting ready to call on God to light this altar on fire, but he says, you know what, wait, before I do that, I want you to pour water all over the calf all over the altar to the point where there was almost like a big puddle underneath the altar now if you've never been around a campfire uh you may not understand this but it is incredibly difficult and nearly impossible to light something that's wet you need dry wood if you're going to do a campfire if, if the wood is wet you know it's not able to catch fire and so here he's he's taking an impossible test and making it even more impossible by drenching it with water. This is how full of the spirit he is. This is how confident he is in what God can do. And then he cries out to the Lord and this massive fire lights the entire thing up and it's an incredible moment. And then to take matters to the next level, Elijah takes out a sword and takes out the 450 prophets of Baal by the power of God. Incredible story, incredible situation. But then in the next chapter, we see a very different situation, All right? Let me read to you real quick, just so we have context of what happens, All right? Full of the tank is this, 1 Kings 18, 36 through 40. At the usual time of offering that evening sacrifice, Elisha, the prophet, walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought me back to yourself, brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down to the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all. And Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. One man's spiritual tank was so full that it could call on God to light a fire on a wet sacrifice. One man could bring a whole nation back to God. One man could wipe out 450 of God's enemies in one day. Imagine what you could do with a spiritual tank that was full. I believe one teenager with a full tank can win his whole family to God. One teenager can turn a whole school back to God. One teenager can transform an entire generation. But like my road trip, that full tank can quickly go to empty. And when Jezebel, the wife of the king, heard what had happened, she sent word that she was going after Elijah and that she was going to have Elijah killed. 
And even though Elijah just finished taking out 450 prophets, listen to how he reacted when he heard this woman was after him. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3 through 4. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. How radically different is that from the man that we first heard about, right? I mean, in just one chapter, he had just finished doing the impossible, calling down fire, taking out the enemies of God, doing this incredible act, and yet he gets word that the queen is mad at him and wants his head, and now suddenly... He goes from all powerful to depressed, suicidal, tired, and feeling all alone. Here's what I've discovered. Just because I filled my gas tank a week ago doesn't mean that I still have gas today. See, here, here's the problem. A lot of us think because we got filled one time that that's going to last us a lifetime. And that's just not how it works. The only way that works is what was happening to me at the beginning of the pandemic. When we first got on quarantine, I remember I filled my gas tank. And then a couple months later, I went to fill it again. Now, usually I have to fill my tank every few weeks. And I realized I was saving a ton on gas. Not just because gas was cheaper, but because I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't using my car. And so I didn't need to fill it. The only way you don't need to fill your spiritual tank is if you're not growing or going anywhere spiritually. But if you are doing anything remotely spiritually, if you're trying to grow, if you even claim that you're a Christian, there is a usage that's going into that tank and you can quickly end up on empty and you can't just rely on the fact that you got saved one day or that you got baptized or that you used to go to church or that you read your Bible when you were young. What you did yesterday doesn't count for what you need tomorrow. On this road trip of life, we need to constantly be refilling our tank if we desire to keep going on the journey that God has for us. Listen, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 through 19 says, I called forth a mighty army from Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in a dry wasteland. In that chapter, God is reminding the people of Israel of all the great things he did for them when he brought them out of slavery in Egypt. But he's saying, listen, as great as that was, you can't live on that forever. Just because you ate three days ago doesn't mean you're not hungry today. Right? Every day, the same way you need bread, you know, figuratively, although I need bread literally, the same way you need food, bread, and water to live every day, you need the bread and water of God to spiritually live every day. Here, God reminds us that we need to not focus on the past because God's given us something new. When Pastor Jason and I were running out of gas, the first thing we started to do was look for a place where we can refill was look for a place where we can refill. We need to get back to the source. We need to go where we can be refilled. And even though we barely rolled into a gas station, we found one and we were able to refill and continue on the journey that we had started on. And that's what eventually ended up happening to Elijah. God made a way for him through the wilderness until he got to a mountain. And the Bible tells us that God told him to stand at the mountain because the presence of God was going to pass by him. I mentioned this last week, but it, it needs to be mentioned again today. When you need a refilling of the spirit, you need to go back to the source. You need to go back to God's presence. We talked about this a lot last week, but hear me when I'm telling you. Some of you, you're running on E because school is stressing you out. Some of you are still working part-time jobs. Some of you have a lot of extra stuff going on at home. There's all these added stressors in life that are draining your spiritual tank. And there is no substitute for getting alone in the presence of God. 
It doesn't matter what you've accomplished for God in the past. It doesn't matter where you feel like you were. There's times where you just need to go back to the presence of God and get a refilling. How do we refill? By worshiping, by reading our Bible, by praying and spending time in his presence, by literally sometimes just sitting there and reflecting on the goodness of God. There is such an empowerment and a refilling of your spirit when you just try to get close to God. The Bible is clear when it says, draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. When you have a desire to get close to God and take that effort to get close to God, he will get close close to you. And in that closeness is the refilling. And listen to how Elijah ends up getting refilled. First Kings chapter 19, verse 11 through 12 says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. I love that passage of scripture, especially because of all the years that I've spent in youth ministry. You know, this year, uh, because of COVID-19, we lost our spring breakaway. We lost summer breakaway. Uh, momentum is still happening, and we'll give you some announcement on that, although it's it's completely different than how it has been in the past. We lost a lot of these major moments throughout the year where we get filled spiritually. But here's the problem, and, and I love that sometimes God strips away what we think we need to remind us of what we really need. Some of us, our, our only time of being spiritually fulfilled is at these major events. When we go to spring breakaway, when we have uh, summer camp, when we have momentum, when we have thousands of people surrounding us, pushing us, when we have three days or, or five days away from everything to only focus on God and to be fully filled with his presence. But as much as I love those events and I can't wait to do them again, here's the problem when you rely on that to be the only source of refilling. Those events are far between. Those events although they're impactful in the moment, are not always readily available, maybe two, three times a year. And as we saw this year, sometimes none at all. You can't keep relying for these major earthquakes and windstorms and fires to be the only thing that lights you up because more often than not, God is able and willing to fill your spiritual tank with a gentle whisper. What does that mean? It means you don't need this huge band. You don't need, uh, you know, these amazing speakers and lights and a thousand people around you to get into the presence of God. You just need a desire and the Lord. Wherever you are, even now where you're watching this, you can experience the presence of God in just as powerful a way when you are willing to sit there and listen to that gentle whisper. Here's what I've discovered. Sometimes we even pay more attention to the gentle whisper because here's, here's the truth. And we're seeing it even now with COVID with people wearing masks where you're not able to hear them clearly. When it's a gentle whisper, you lean in, right? When somebody is whispering to you, you lean in and you focus. You close off all the other sounds and you pay attention to just that person. Maybe God is asking you to lean in tonight, to, to just get closer because he's speaking to you, but there's so much noise around you that you're not able to hear it. Maybe we need to quiet ourselves, to, to take a moment to get away from all the noise, get our minds off the distractions and just listen. It reminds me of a, a story I once heard about a, a Native American man who was walking with a businessman in a a busy downtown city. And, you know, there's all this noise, cabs going and, and, you know, obviously you know what a downtown sounds like, people walking, talking, all the noise. And suddenly the Native American who had lived his whole life uh, in nature says, wait, there's a grasshopper. 
And the businessman's like, what do you mean there's a grasshopper? I don't hear anything. He's like, what? And he looks down, and he goes to the curb, and he cups his hand, and he picks up this little grasshopper. And the businessman's like, how in the world did you hear a grasshopper in the middle of a downtown city? Like, all the noise, all the traffic. How did you hear that? The Native American man then puts his hand in his pocket, pulls out some change, throws it on the ground, and about four or five people walking down stopped and looked around. He said, your ear is always in tune to what you want to hear. See, when you want to hear the voice of God, even with all the noise, you can still hear him. When you want to experience the presence of God, even when your life is incredibly busy, you can still find time to experience the presence of God. In that moment, you have to decide, who do I want to listen to? What do I want to do? And so here's my question for you as I wrap this up. How's your spiritual tank doing? Where do you feel you're at spiritually? Some of you might say, Pastor, I'm full. I'm doing great. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm awesome. Well, let me ask you this. Are you as close to God as you've ever been? Or are you confident in that you're doing everything God has asked you to do? Because a lot of times I think I'm full, but it's like, you know, sometimes my wife will be like, you need gas and I'll be a quarter tank. And I'm like, Meh, I got like another 40, 50 miles in it. Right? We like to stretch that E as long as we can. Some of us, when I ask you, how's your spiritual tank? You might say, well, I'm not full, but I'm not empty. I'm, I'm about right in the middle. Listen, it's a little dangerous to be right in the middle. Think about it like this, and as the times get crazier, and uh, you know, I feel like summer we blinked and it was over, and and fall could quickly be over. But here's what I've discovered in winter: in winter, you can't have half a tank of gas because if your gas tank is low, it can freeze in the tank. Recommended is to try to have your tank full all the time because the outside elements have an effect. Is your life crazier now than it's been lately? Then that's more of a reason to be on full. And not be satisfied with being just in the middle. And maybe if you're honest with yourself, you say, Pastor, I'm on E. I've been relying on what God gave me the last time we were in Excel in person. I haven't read my Bible. I haven't worshipped. This is probably one of the, the first videos I've seen even in a while. I'm running on fumes. To you, I say, hey, you can still get filled. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, even if you're empty, you can still fill the tank. That's what I love about my God, is that my God is willing, even if we're on empty in the middle of the wilderness, to send a tow truck to pick us up and fill us again. And I believe God will meet you where you are if there is a desire to meet with him. So here's my challenge to you. Decide where you're at spiritually. Be honest with yourself. Look at yourself internally and ask yourself that question, question, where is my spiritual tank? And then do everything you can to get it back to full. And then practice keeping it as close to full as you can. Going back to the source as often as possible to fill your tank and to make sure that you are where you want to, where God wants you to be doing what God wants you to do. So I want to pray with you, young man, young lady, or whoever's watching right now. And I want to challenge you when I'm done praying, take some time to get along with God. It doesn't have to be hours. It take 10 minutes just now to evaluate, to even ask the Lord, Lord, where is my spiritual tank? What do you want me to do? And experience a refilling of his presence. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for those who are watching this, Father. I pray even now that your presence will speak to them, God, that you would draw them the same way you draw Elijah to the mountain. And Lord, I pray that your presence will go before them. I pray that you would fill them spiritually afresh and anew, God. I pray that they would experience an outpouring of your spirit, that they would receive the confidence and boldness that comes from being full of the spirit of God. Lord, I, I pray for those of us who are running on fumes, God, who are on empty or, or even just satisfied with coasting in the middle. And God, I pray that there would be a greater desire for your presence, that we wouldn't just rely on these major events and these major outings, these fires and thunderstorms that you talked about when the mountain with Elijah. God, I pray 
that we would just lean in for that gentle whisper. They would experience your presence in a real and tangible way wherever we are. And that all of our tanks would be at full capacity so that we can do everything you called us to do. Be everything you called us to be and experience the fullness of God as you intended it to be so. We thank you for all that and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Take the time. Speak to the Lord. Draw in. Lean in and listen to his voice. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.